thank you everybody for attending today's session um, where I will be talking about nutrition and ADHD. This is actually the third session that I have run on nutrition and ADHD. The first one was an overview of what um, and how nutrition and nutritional therapy can be used to support ADHD. The second one was specifically on gut health and how nutrition and ADHD and gut health all interact with each other. And today I'll touch on gut health as well, because we know that a lot of our dopamine is made in the gut. Um, a lot of dopamine is made in the brain as well. So today's session will be focusing predominantly on dopamine. And I think many people who have a diagnosis or suspect a diagnosis of ADHD, you know what dopamine is potentially, or you know at least that you are potentially low or that we will see that some of the symptoms of low dopamine and high dopamine actually are the same. So that is sort of an overview of what we'll be talking about today. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction as to who I am. I'll also speak about what ADHD is because there are a number of people that are attending today that haven't attended the previous two sessions. I'll talk about the role of dopamine. Is it high or is it low dopamine? Questionable. I'll talk about how dopamine actually works, some of the current management options of ADHD using medication, um, and then I'll talk about the nutrition approach to ADHD. Actually, I haven't updated this, so it's not all entirely true. I'm not talking about blood sugar balance today. So who am I? I am Dana Chapman. I am a nutritional therapist. Nutritional therapy uses a foundation of functional medicine, which is more of a, an American term. But what nutritional therapy does is it tries to understand the symptoms that somebody is experiencing. And we then look at what is causing those symptoms and we try and address the root cause of those. When it comes to ADHD, it's slightly different. Because ADHD is not something that you can fix, but it is something that you can manage with supplements. You can manage it with medication as well. Lots of people don't want to go on medication. So from a nutritional therapy perspective, when I'm thinking about ADHD, I'm thinking about how can you manage the symptoms that somebody doesn't want to experience anymore when it comes to their ADHD. What can we do to manage those through diet and lifestyle? Lifestyle is very important. I don't just talk about food. Um, and I look at co what's called comorbidities as well. And I'll speak a little bit more about comorbidities in a minute because lots of people who have ADHD have other conditions as well. And that can be because of what ADHD makes you do, i.e. binge eating or forgetting to eat or craving those high sugar foods. Um. But ADHD is very comorbid with mental health conditions as well. And I think if you look at the physiology and how we create our neurotransmitters, ADHD and poor mental health follow the same neurotransmitter pathways. So I will be talking about dopamine today, but just know that ADHD isn't just a, a lack of or having or an irregulation of dopamine. But ADHD, there are other elements of other neurotransmitters that are important as well. So that's a little bit about me, a little bit about um, ADHD as well. And I really apologize if you do have ADHD and this slide is really, really busy. Rather try and look at me and what I'm going to be saying rather than all of the words on the page. And I have been given this feedback before and I have not as yet taken it on board. But what is ADHD? So we know that ADHD is a neurobiological or neurodevelopmental, and I put disorder in inverted commas because is it a disorder or is it just the way that your brain has developed and it's the genes that you have? But it being a neurobiological disorder means that we should be treating the biology, not treating the person or trying to fix the person. It's the biology that we need to look at and it's how the body actually then functions. The prevalence of ADHD is about 5% of the population. So in children, that's rising to about 7%. And we know that there are a lot of people who self-identify as ADHD. So this 
doesn't take those numbers into account. And I think more and more people are um, being exposed to ADHD and we are seeing more diagnoses this, these days, but at the moment, the prevalence is about 5% of the population. ADHD is complex and multifactorial. So it is not just a lack of dopamine. It is not just about dopamine like I touched on earlier. There are other aspects that you can be thinking about as well. So serotonin is very important. GABA is very important. But you're looking at those neurotransmitters. You're also looking at inflammation in the body. And the role of the gut is massive. But the research isn't quite there, specifically with the gut microbiome and ADHD. We don't quite have the research yet. But there is research going into the gut microbiome in an ADHD presentation. So I've already mentioned that ADHD is often comorbid, which means it happens at the same time with other mental health conditions. So that's frequently observed. Um, and other health conditions are seen in about 75% of cases of people with ADHD. So we really need to look at that. We need to be looking at the person as a whole and treating the person as a whole, uh, not just looking at the ADHD and what somebody may or may not be suffering with mentally. ADHD has a very big genetic component. So about 80% of ADHD comes from the genetics. And actually, I'll be talking about the genetic pathway of dopamine today to try and help explain how our genes actually work when we are trying to make our dopamine. Um, but we can't forget that there is an environmental factor as well. So whenever we talk about genes, we talk about you may have the presence or absence of a gene, but it's the environment when it comes to genes that pulls the trigger. So your environment needs to be such that the genes express themselves in a certain way. So it can be quite complex, but just think ADHD is a combination of environmental triggers as well as genetic um, predispositions. Uh we know within ADHD that structural and functional brain changes are not actually found consistently. So the reason I mention this is because I listened to a podcast with Stephen Bartlett and he had a neuroscientist on who scanned his brain and from the brain scan said, you've got ADHD. But the research doesn't back that up. So structural and functional changes of the brain are not actually found consistently within ADHD. There are no biological diagnostic markers, so you can't go for a blood test and that will tell you that you've got ADHD. It's all questionnaire based. And I'm sure you all know that there are three major forms of ADHD, one being hyperactive or impulsive, the second one being predominantly inattentive, and then you've got the combined type. So what I wanted to start bringing in now after discussing what ADHD is, is that we know through the research that the neurotransmitters, including dopamine and norepinephrine, or what we call noradrenaline, as well as their receptors, influence the areas of the brain which are responsible for regulating attention, thoughts, emotions, behavior, and actions. So this is how dopamine starts coming through in ADHD symptoms is because dopamine and the receptors, so we can't forget the role of the receptors, and I'll be talking about those in a bit more detail soon. Um, those influence the areas of the brain. So dopamine needs to bind to its, its receptor effectively to allow for regulation of attention, to allow for good thought processes, to regulate emotions, for behavior and actions as well. So dopamine does play a large role in ADHD, but already we've got another neurotransmitter here, which is norepinephrine or noradrenaline. Is, um, norepinephrine is more the American term for it. So we also know through the research that imbalances in dopaminergic, so dopamine, or 
adrenergic, so noradrenaline systems, contribute to what we call the pathophysiology or how ADHD comes about. So we know that there is an imbalance in dopamine and noradrenaline, and that contributes to ADHD symptomatology and presentation. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, and it is actually produced by neurons in the brain. Okay, dopamine helps us remember that something felt good so that we go ahead and do it again. So it is that reward center in the brain. It helps us remember that doing things felt good. There are certain stimuli that help produce that dopamine um, or help produce the motivation and reward. And that includes things like sex, food, water, drugs, and listening to music. We know that all of those activities increase the release of dopamine. So dopamine is actually released in the anticipation of reward. It's not actually released when you're eating that food. It's the anticipation of what you will get from that food. That's what creates or releases the dopamine. We know that dopamine is, um, and dopamine neurotransmission, so that dopamine actually being active plays a central role in our working memory and the ability to retain information for short periods of time. So we know that dopamine is important in some of those activities that people with ADHD really struggle with, and that's that working memory and ability to retain information. We know that a carbohydrate-rich meal is associated with increases in dopamine, but that is in normal weight individuals. In obese individuals, a carbohydrate-rich meal actually results in a decrease in dopamine. So this could be some of the reasons why somebody may binge eat because you're looking for that dopamine. And when binge eating happens, you normally are going for those foods high in sugar and high in fat, so carbohydrate rich, because you get that dopamine hit from it. And people with ADHD often have what we call disordered eating. Um, lots of people with ADHD suffer from binge eating as well. And the role of dopamine is important in ADHD because, and the research absolutely backs this up. And the medications that are given to people with ADHD also illustrate the role that dopamine has um, in ADHD. So medications used to treat ADHD symptoms act to increase those neurotransmitters in the brain. So they act to increase the amount of dopamine and the amount of norepinephrine or noradrenaline. So those are some of the roles of dopamine. We know that it's the reward center. We know that it is produced when we anticipate reward. We know that it can be produced when we eat high carbohydrate rich foods. It plays a central role in our working memory and us being able to retain information for short periods of time. And if you have ADHD, I'm sure you have been told that all the activities that you do is because you are seeking that dopamine hit or you need to increase your dopamine. But actually, do you have high dopamine or do you actually have low dopamine? Because some of the symptoms of low dopamine and high dopamine are the same. So you can see here highlighted insomnia is a symptom of both low and high dopamine. Anxiety is a symptom of both low and high dopamine. That inability to focus is another symptom of low dopamine and high dopamine. Dopamine is very excitatory. So if you have too much of it, your brain won't stop and you will struggle to have 
focus. So this is one of the key slides that I'll be showing and talking through how dopamine is actually made in the body. I think many people think that uh, our bodies just work by magic but they don't. Our bodies work by biochemical processes that transform food into active compounds that the body needs to function optimally. Now this is, um, this first sentence is taken from the slide above. So we know that dopamine and norepinephrine, as well as their receptors, influence the functioning of the areas of the brain which are responsible for regulation of attention, thoughts, emotions, behavior, and actions. So we know that dopamine is essential for us and is essential for all of these things to work effectively in our bodies. So how much dopamine is actually available in your body or available to be used by your body is a combination of making of dopamine, which is this top section, and removing dopamine. Because we could make a good amount of dopamine, but we could also be really good at detoxifying, metabolizing, and getting rid of that dopamine. So we need to look at both ends of the scale, how we're making it, how we're getting rid of it, but we can't negate the impact or the effect of receptors. So this here, these two green dots here, the SLC6A3, that is one of the, that's a dopamine transporter. So that's important to know as well. But this DRD2 is a dopamine receptor. So we need to know how well our receptors are working. We need to know how well we are able to make our dopamine. And we need to know how well we detoxify and get rid of our dopamine. So dopamine is made from an amino acid. So phenylalanine and tyrosine are both amino acids. We can make dopamine from tyrosine. But tyrosine gets converted into what we call L-dopa, which um, is often used in Parkinson's medication. Um, and L-dopa is then converted in the body to dopamine. So this is what we call um, a genetic pathway, but this is how we make dopamine in the body. So dopamine is made from amino acids. And that's the first important thing. Amino acids come from protein. Protein is normally made up of many amino acids all bound together. Um, but tyrosine is the one amino acid that we do need to be able to make our dopamine. Then it gets converted. And what we need to know here is these purple blobs are what we call cofactors. Cofactors are almost ingredients that you put together in a cake. So tyrosine might be the flour. And then what you need is <clears throat> the eggs and the sugar to make the cake. The cake will be dopamine. And all of these are ingredients that are needed in the body to be able to make our dopamine. So you can already see that we need protein, but we also need things like folate, which is this methyl folate. So we need folate, we need vitamin C, we need vitamin D, and we need vitamin B6. Those are the key nutrients. They're not the only nutrients, but they are the key nutrients that are needed to make dopamine. Then we can see that dopamine it needs to be detoxified as well. And for the detoxification to happen, we need magnesium, we need zinc, we need vitamin B2, and we need something called SAMe, which is a methyl donor. So again, that methylation process is important. So this is actually a neurotransmitter panel with a genetic testing company that I use. And this is an ADHD client of mine. We ran this uh, neurotransmitter panel on her. So we can see these are the genes that are, um, that are needed for the conversions to happen. And if you start seeing oranges and reds, then what you see 
is that that pathway is compromised due to that person's genes. So this MTHFR, there's one green dot, but there's also one orange dot. So the availability of methylfolate for that person will be reduced, which means that you need to be getting more of it in your diet or you need to be supplementing. So the genes are um, will tell you whether you've got a greater need or not of key nutrients. If you were making a good amount of dopamine, but you were clearing it really, really quickly, then there are certain things that can be used to slow down that detoxification or getting rid of that dopamine. And here you can think about including things like curcumin, which is turmeric, or quercetin, which is found in things like red onions, but you can also supplement things like quercetin. This SLC gene takes dopamine and reuptakes it into, um, into the cell. So how dopamine actually works is it crosses the synapse within the, within the neurons. So the neuron will have dopamine. Dopamine gets released into the synapse. And then you've got your receptors which catch the dopamine and actually make it active. The SLC takes that dopamine back up into the cell, which you don't actually want. You want the receptor to actually catch the dopamine so that it can become active. So your dopamine receptors can become really important here as well. And if you've got genetic predispositions, which mean that these DRD2 receptors aren't functioning well, then you know that you may need a bigger pool of dopamine to get that dopamine effect because the receptors aren't working as they should. Now, in ADHD people, what we often see is an imbalance in copper and zinc. Now, zinc is very important for the removal of dopamine. But zinc is also very important for this dopamine being able to um, attach to the dopamine receptor. So zinc is a really key nutrient when we're thinking about dopamine and dopamine synthesis. Now dopamine, nor adrenaline, which is what I spoke about earlier as well, nor epinephrine, it's also uh, implicated in ADHD. And if somebody has that copper and zinc imbalance, what we can see is copper is needed for this conversion from dopamine to noradrenaline. So if your copper is really high and your zinc is very low, what we can see is your dopamine actually gets shunted to making noradrenaline. So you may be left with less of a dopamine pool because everything is being pulled down to noradrenaline. So noradrenaline is also really important to be thinking about. And norad from noradrenaline, we actually make our adrenaline as well. So this is a really complicated slide. And if anyone wants more detail, I'll happily go into it. But I think what I'm trying to highlight is how we make dopamine is really important. But what's also important is to know how we metabolize dopamine and get rid of it. And are our receptors actually working as they should? So what zinc can do as well as re, uh, getting rid of our dopamine, zinc is also really important for blocking or binding to the DAT gene, which is this SLC gene, which blocks the reuptake of that dopamine into the cell. So that allows the dopamine to hang around in the synapse longer, which means that the receptors have longer to be able to work and actually catch that dopamine and make it active. We know that uh, drugs that are used to uh, help in ADHD, so your amphetamines, block this reuptake. So that's how our amphetamines work. 
but just think zinc works in the same way, probably not as high as an effect. But if you are deficient in zinc, you may be recirculating your dopamine, which doesn't allow it the chance to attach to its receptor. Um, and I've mentioned about the copper. So that's a really complicated slide. I hope I haven't um, duffled it up. And I hope that that has given you just some clarity as to how dopamine actually works. Now I want to talk about how we can actually increase dopamine naturally. So if that is what you need, if you figure out that you have um, high dopamine, then what you want to be focusing on is that metabolism and getting rid of the dopamine. But if you want to increase your dopamine, there are a number of ways to do that. Whenever we're talking about dopamine or ADHD or mental health conditions, we need to remember that we are talking about brain health. And we need to then be thinking of essential fatty acids. So omega-3 is essential for the brain and body to function optimally. Our diets these days are much higher in what we call omega-6 than omega-3. And that means that that puts you into potentially a pro-inflammatory state. And pro-inflammatory states can block your neurotransmitters from binding to those neurotransmitter receptors. So we need to be thinking about omega-3. And my favorite sources are oily fish. I always recommend oily fish at least three times a week. If you have ADHD, you might want to consider an omega-3 supplement as well. We need to be thinking about the micro-element deficiencies. So we know through the research that people with ADHD often have zinc, magnesium, and iron deficiencies. Those are all needed for our neurotransmitter production. So we need to be thinking about including those either in our diet or in supplementation. And if you've been for a blood test and been told that your iron levels are fine at 20, then please don't believe that. The optimal level of iron that you need is between about 70 and 100. So we're not looking at, you know, absence or presence of disease in when we're looking at blood tests. When I'm looking at blood tests, I'm looking at do you have sufficient iron to be optimal so that your neurotransmitters are made effectively? We know that, or hopefully you know from the previous slide, that other nutrients are essential to be able to make our dopamine. So we need to ensure that these are in our diet, or again, we need to be thinking about supplementation. So folate, vitamin D, vitamin A, iron and vitamin B6 are all essential to be able to make dopamine in our bodies. B6 is actually really important for all of our neurotransmitter production. And if you suffer from depression or anxiety, then this is really key because serotonin we know is our happy hormone, but serotonin is also very much needed for focus. So we need to be thinking about serotonin when we're thinking about ADHD as well. And then GABA is our anti-anxiety neurotransmitter. So we've got loads of excitatory neurotransmitters and people with ADHD often are on that excitatory pathway. So we need that GABA to help bring in the calm and to help um, reduce any anxiety. So B6 is a really key nutrient. So what are the, some of the top foods? I've put here oily fish and that would probably be my number one top food for anybody who has ADHD or poor mental health or both. And that's because you are getting your omega-3, but in oily fish, you are also getting zinc and you are also getting B vitamins. So your B6. So some of the top foods that I've listed here I've listed them here because they contain a number of the nutrients that are needed for creating that dopamine. Um, iron, uh, salmon has got iron in it as well. The oily fish will have iron in it as well. Chicken and red meat. So any protein, like I said, our neurotransmitters, especially dopamine, is made from an amino acid. So protein really is your building blocks 
for your neurotransmitters. If you don't have the raw ingredients, you won't be able to make your dopamine. And it starts with protein. Yes, you can have vegan or vegetable sources as well. But I find that you're not getting things or you're not getting sufficient zinc from plant sources. So I prefer recommending at least once a day having an animal source of protein. Avocado is also great. Avocado is loaded with about 20 different vitamins and minerals. Green leafy vegetables are key. They are going to be really high in folate. And you saw that that folate was really important for converting your um, your protein into your L-DOPA. Things like nuts and seeds are going to be high in magnesium and high in zinc. Things like offal, so chicken livers is my favorite. I love making a chicken liver pate or just having chicken livers um, sauteed with some garlic and maybe some passata. Um, offal is amazing. It's very high in folate, very high in B vitamins, very high in zinc, very high in iron, and it has got vitamin A. So that would be another one of my absolute key nutrients or ingredients for making your dopamine and supporting ADHD is to include some form of offal in your diet. So it doesn't need to be livers. It can be kidney, it can be heart, it can be any other offal from any animal. Um, nuts and seeds are going to be great for zinc and magnesium. Um, sweet potato is high in fiber, which is going to be feeding the gut microbiome, keeping it happy. Um, but it's also quite high in vitamin A. And then chickpeas, which again is going to be high in, um, it will have a little bit of zinc, it will have a little bit of iron, it will have your B vitamins, and it will be a source of protein as well. Now, Caffeine, caffeine, yes or no. Some people react badly to caffeine and it may be then because you uh, don't have the um, enzyme to break it down effectively. But caffeine has been shown to allow dopamine to flow more freely and therefore have a bigger effect within the body. So it allows dopamine more time in that synapse, so more time to be absorbed in the body. And if you have ADHD, you may find that you um, are reaching for that coffee more often than not. And it may be because subconsciously or consciously, you have noticed the effect that caffeine has on your dopamine levels. I've put sugar here. I don't often like talking about what you shouldn't be having. But if I were to talk about one thing that you shouldn't be having, sugar is it. Sugar will give you a very short spike in dopamine, but it is not long lasting at all. And it depletes your B vitamins. And those B vitamins we've seen are so key for making your dopamine. Sugar will also imbalance your blood sugar levels, which means that you have erratic energy throughout the day. So there's a number of reasons to cut sugar out. And I've put here at the bottom, what about the role of the gut? So we've also always got to be thinking about the role of the gut because if your gut is not functioning, you will be eating food, but you will not be absorbing the nutrients from that food. And if your gut is not working effectively, the key nutrients for dopamine production, such as iron and zinc, won't be absorbed in your body. So if you have poor gut health, you can eat all the great food in the world, but you may not then be absorbing it. So we need to keep in the back of our minds that gut health is absolutely key. There are some other ways to naturally um, raise our dopamine. And these are lifestyle activities. So we know that physical activity or exercise releases dopamine in the brain. It is used to help regulate hyperactivity. And it needs to be often. So it can't be a run a month when you feel like you are motivated. It's the consistent, um, it's consistent exercising that helps release that dopamine. Cold water immersion has actually been shown to help produce dopamine as well. Um, I don't think anyone's going to be uh, immersing themselves for an hour in 14 degrees. But um, if you were, 
to immerse yourself in cold water for an hour, the increase in dopamine is about 250%. And we know that noradrenaline or norepinephrine is important as well in ADHD. And that was increased by 530%. But we know that there are effects of cold water immersion from as little as five minutes. So that can be one method to help increase dopamine in the body. And we also know that listening to your favorite music or watching your favorite movie are other ways that you can safely and naturally increase your dopamine production as well. And that is it from me. I hope this has not been too complicated. Dopamine can be quite a complicated beast to try and explain. I hope I haven't fluffed it up too much. 